lite osäkert på vad som hände efter vi hade lämnat jorden. Marsprojektet var redan ett misslyckande. Vår enda utväg var yttre rymden. Och det sista folket ville höra var att mer pengar skulle spenderas på rymdutforskning. We hebben een paar berichten kunnen ontvangen. Ze spraken over gebeurtenissen op een apocalyptische schaal. En sindsdien hebben we niks meer gehoord. Het is verschrikkelijk om te weten dat dit zou gebeuren. Dat we om deze reden gestuurd zijn om een nieuw thuis te zoeken. drifting through space, temporarily out of cryo slumber. It was an exercise just not to think about it. We continued onward for almost a millennia until the decision was made between all personnel to return. Welcome back to another episode of Esther Yea. Firstly, I'd like to thank those who collaborated with me in making the introduction for this video. Firstly, we have Strict Toaster for providing his city, Cedar Valley, as a stage for an apocalyptic scene after a nuclear strike in a modern setting, and when the sea levels started rising. I was really impressed by his detailing once again when he provided me the footage to make a convincing atmosphere of this kind of scenario. It was nice collaborating with you again since the SimCity days, which was like three years ago. For those who don't know him, please check out his channel here. Secondly, we have Kiri Alice for providing the first voiceover in the introduction in Swedish. I was actually very surprised that he was able to get back to me so soon because he has like nearly 2 million subscribers and I kind of got that stereotypical image of someone who is too busy and popular to look at emails or something. Maybe he had like a manager or an agent uh, replying to emails. But then I saw his reply in the inbox. And I'm very happy to have him on this episode of Aster Yea, sharing his really unique and amazing voice. Please check out his channel here if you're not familiar with him. Next we have Silverette, providing the second half of the introduction in Dutch. Honestly, it's the first time I've ever talked to him, for those who have this stereotypical view that all YouTubers just somehow know each other. Which will eventually happen, but this was the first time meeting him for me. And I was really excited to have him on this episode of Esther Yea as well, because he's also pretty big in the City Skylines community. You can view his channel here. Lastly, we have Fresh Popcorn. I haven't met him prior to this either, so Strict Toaster introduced us. If you guys don't know, Strict Toaster and Fresh Popcorn, along with Flux Trance, are doing a collaboration series called Arrowhead Junction. You can view it through Fresh Popcorn's channel to get started. Again, all of these guys are great at city building in their own style, and I am immensely grateful to have them with me on this episode of Astria. Yeah. Thanks again. This is going to be a relatively short episode because I made this during the summer, but never got the time to edit and write the script that I wanted. I have done nothing since the last episode except cleaning up the Weltschmerz area as if the citizens of Esther Yea clean up the setting before making the island a permanent settlement. I will be doing two things in this episode. Firstly, as you may remember from the last episode, I have removed all above ground highways because I want to prevent the dominance of automobile culture in Esther Yea, save space and natural habitats, and have neighborhoods better closely connected without barriers or objects of hindrance. But I did make a note that I will have some elevated highways blended into the environment of the city while most highways in the city will be underground as a kind of subterranean freight system like the current experiment in Switzerland and Europe, which we'll go over in a future episode. 
For blending in highways into the city environment, I'll be demonstrating one example in this part of the city. Secondly, I'll be making a new park on this small island in the middle of the river. This park will be a memorial site dedicated to the victims of nuclear war. I will have a stacked elevated highway coming from the unnamed inner city neighborhood that comes from the Zaudia neighborhood, stretching all the way into this new neighborhood and making its way into the city center and this future neighborhood that I will call Runau. This elevated stacked highway will actually come up from underground and get connected to the regional underground highway that brings in freight and tourists according to the game's mechanics. Of course in this universe of Aster Yia, the city is the only human habitat we know so far, thus people wouldn't be coming into the city through a regional highway. The regional highway and the word beltway will connect at this junction that will be integrated into the city environment above ground. I'm going to keep the footprint of this elevated highway very minimal to the best of my abilities and with the tools available through city skylines to prevent drastic segregation of the neighborhoods. This will be reminiscent of the Eutropica city for those who followed my previous series that is loosely based off of Japan's roadways. Again, the city will be very dense, so I'm going to utilize all of the given space displayed in each episode for urban development so we can eventually save space for natural habitats on the outskirts of the city, say like dedicating it to natural parks or reserves that will connect to the Waldine some kite animal highway that goes meandering around the city. I'm going to force all human urbanization into concentrated centers, but keep this man-made development in respect to nature. The basic principle is no sprawl and yes to density. I have laid out the foundation of this area with the elevated stacked highway running through. I am now going to dedicate this area to this naturalized junction. The junction will ramp up to meet the grade of the elevated highway. The source of inspiration for this contouring junction comes from Tokyo, Japan. The Meguro Sky Garden atop the sloping roof of the Shuto Expressway Ohashi Junction. This is one of the most unique places in Tokyo where you can enjoy the poetry of the Tokyo urban landscape, featuring a Japanese garden trail spiraling upward, offering excellent 360 views such as Mount Fuji to the west and Tokyo Tower to the east. Because of the selection of trees and vegetation, it can be enjoyed all year long when you want a nice stroll or a picnic. It's an uncanny alternative of green space in the dense urban landscape of Tokyo. I'm going to let the video go forward into a time lapse so you can see the construction of the junction.
I attempted this creation in my original City Skyline series in Utropica with the Fluxburg Embassy and the Flux Junction, if you guys remember. But at that time, the mods available were still limited in their capabilities, so it was more of an interchange built alongside a hill. For this interchange, I wanted to create a somewhat livable environment, or at least a place of socialization and utilization. I placed a subway station in the middle of the ramping junction, and transformed the landscape into a park featuring an outdoor track field and other amenities. Along the ramping pathway are benches, rest stops like picnic tables and vending machines, and scenic structures to help visitors enjoy the setting, like gazebos. There will be many examples of hidden or integrated highways into the city landscape in future episodes. Let's move onward to the second half of this episode, the Kakehashi Memorial Park. In the Sustaining Ecology episode, I said I was going to naturalize the rivers of the island, and I will be leaving much of the vegetation and structure of the rivers intact, but we must consider the protection of the city. In this new earth with rampant climate change, the citizens of Assyria must face battering storms and erosion. I will line the banks of the rivers with sea walls to protect human development. However, large movements of water must be diverted to prevent flooding and with the help of sediment that will continue to move towards the oceans, we will use that soil to help expand the island in various and productive ways in future episodes. But for now, let's line the river with some sea walls, while also using natural alternatives to help with this erosion, like mangrove trees to latch onto sediment with its wide root systems. For Kakehashi Memorial Park, this might seem a little off topic, but I feel like this is relevant to cities in general. In the beginning, when we developed farming after the hunter-gatherer days, we came from semi-permanent villages to more permanent settlements once we've advanced our agricultural techniques and were better able to predict the seasons. We had a surplus of food from agriculture, our cities became bigger as population increased. This also involved in protecting our cities from outside invaders that might want to take our surplus of food or other riches while agriculture allowed that not everyone can participate in farming, but can participate in other works like artisanal work or other craftsman work. Our ways of defending evolved constantly, from walls of city-states to missile defense systems of our countries. Many cities over the millennia have been destroyed by warfare like Hannibal's Carthage from Rome, or the fall of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks, which is now Istanbul. Sieging a city would normally take days, weeks, or even months, like the siege of Constantinople that took almost two months. With every new advancement in warfare, sieging became easier like the Ottoman Turks' new ultimate weapon against Constantinople, the Great Bombard, which is a massive cannon that could penetrate the city's thick walls after weeks of bombardment. As technology continued to advance, warfare became much more deadlier, but not all sieges were a success with the advantage of technology. One example is the Battle of Verdun from World War I, the longest battle in history, nearly lasting a year long, from late February to mid-December. Even with the advancements of machine guns and massive artillery, the French managed to hold the city against the Germans that would result in nearly a million casualties from both sides. One battle that surpasses this in casualties is the Battle of Stalingrad from World War II, probably the bloodiest battle in history after Verdun with almost two million casualties counting both factions of German and Soviet forces alongside civilians. In war, it's normally about taking over cities or towns. As our technology grew ever more horrifyingly, never did we ever have the opportunity to completely annihilate a city in the blink of an eye until now. For the first time in history, we now possess so much power to flatten a city in a second. This happened near the end of World War II when the United States dropped two atomic bombs on the Empire of Japan's two cities. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now we're not going to talk about the controversy surrounding the incident of whether it was justifiable or what actually allowed the decision, but rather talk about remembering the incident as how it happened from the citizens' perspectives that 
perished and those who survive, because that's what this memorial park is about. In the fictional universe of Aster Ye, it is uncertain of what happened to Earth when that generation ship set sail for the deep cosmos in search of a new home. Whatever conflicts unfolded in that time frame that brought humanity to a near extinction on their home planet. But we do have a non-fictional example of what nuclear warfare looks like. I got the amazing opportunity to listen to an atomic bomb survivor during my study abroad experience in Japan at the Hiroshima Memorial Museum provided by my university. From here on, this will be a very graphic in my language as I briefly describe the event as she described us, so just a warning. Her name is Yoshiko Kajimoto, and she was a young teenager when the bomb was dropped. It was the morning of August 6, 1945, beginning her work at the factory at 8.15 a.m., where she produced airplane parts with her schoolmates. What was about to happen had no warning. There were no air raid sirens or alerts. Suddenly from the window, a pure blue flash appeared. She turned and looked at the flash. Her family and friends flashed before her eyes. She knew it had to be a bomb. But not an atomic bomb, as it was a new invention. Quickly responding as trained, she covered her eyes and ears while seeking cover. Covering her face would help prevent her eyes from popping out due to the blast. The ground ruptured upwards like a vicious earthquake, and the factory collapsed. She passed out. Waking up later, she heard the cries and screams of classmates, yelling for their mothers and teachers. She had no idea what had happened. Everything was pitch black around her. The lower part of her body was covered by rubble and unable to move. Eventually, she made it out of the factory with her friend, who had been trapped in the rubble with her. Five or six of her classmates also came out from the rubble, and they all looked at each other. Some of them had hair left, some had no skin, some with flesh wounds so deep that you could even see the bone. It was a sunless, barren wasteland with an unbearable stench coming from burning flesh. They saw other civilians walking around like goats. What appeared like torn clothes hanging from their bodies was actually burnt, ripped skin that had peeled off and hung from their arms and legs. People were burned so badly that it was indistinguishable of whether they were male or female. Their faces had been completely torn off. One middle schooler died right in front of her as he was carrying his severed arm, crying. Collapsed, she examined his face and read extreme sadness in his soul. He was burned instantly and never knew what hit him. One mother was carrying her dead baby that had been carbonized, burnt to a crisp. People were dying of dehydration, running around pleading for water, but her and her classmates knew that they couldn't give a burn victim water, or the shock will kill him. She felt a deep regret that she should have given them water. She eventually reunited with her parents, having survived the disaster, to tell this story, and it was a very difficult lecture to listen to, but I appreciated it greatly for having the opportunity to hear the stories that are now disappearing as survivors pass away. I think their stories should never be forgotten, to remind us of the horrors of, of how humanity has progressed in our power and will to destroy one another, to the point of having the ability to annihilate cities in a flash. Cities, our most complex invention ever, living and breathing organisms that are now the centers of culture, comrades of material objects and ideas, and the homes of millions of people going about their days doing their job or having fun traveling on complicated yet artistic infrastructure. As much as 80,000 people died instantly from the blast and the death toll continued to rise over the months to a total of almost 200,000 from other injuries like radiation. Statistics tend to get lost in translation when you speak about it. It is a difficult thing to measure conceptually. We tend to think of numbers as small controllable digits like cash or problems on math homework, but to pin every single number on a person like you and I is mind-boggling. Just thinking of it, as much as 80,000 people gone from the blast, and my university's student population is only 50,000, add another 30,000 and all of it is gone in a flash. Or the amount of subscribers that I have, 22,000, and add another 58,000 potential subscribers all gone. And to think that this bomb did this much destruction. Decades later, we developed a bomb 3,000 times stronger than that used on Hiroshima. Numbers are a hard thing to digest. I would like to dedicate this park in the middle of Aster Yia to the victims of nuclear war, and I hope that no one else will ever experience such a thing in our real timeline. The name of the park, Kakehashi, comes from an educational project happening now called the Kakehashi Project. It is a fully funded large-scale youth exchange program between the United States and Japan, sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, 
Its objective is to promote a deeper mutual understanding among the people of Japan and the United States, enabling future leaders of U.S.-Japan exchange to form networks and help young people develop wider perspectives to encourage active roles at the global level in the future. The word kakehashi, literally if you were to use these kanji or Chinese characters, means suspension bridge, but changing the kanji to this means to bridge cultural divides or to bring together. I think it's a wonderful term to use in our setting for Astro Yia, a central forum in the middle of the city for people to share their cultural background and socialize. There will also be a monument dedicated to the victims of nuclear war. Around the monument are cherry blossom trees. I chose cherry blossom trees because of the symbolism it has in Japanese culture. Now the meaning of cherry blossoms, or sakura in the Japanese language, minorly changes with each generation. From the aristocratic era of ancient Japan symbolizes reproduction and new life. During the shogunate era of samurai, the falling petals of the cherry blossom symbolizes the ideal death of a samurai, or a peaceful and honorable sacrifice. This meaning was also used during the imperial days of World War II when kamikaze pilots sacrificed themselves to defend the empire. In this current era of Japan, people all over the country, including many visitors from around the world, enjoy the season of blooming cherry blossoms. Many people view it as the transition of life, that life is beautiful yet very fragile and short. The blooming season only lasts for about two weeks in a region. If you count all of Japan, it lasts for about a month, starting from the south of Japan and ending in the north as they bloom along the weeks of April. The symbolism that it generally carries is to cherish life, as life can be very short, like that of the two-week bloom out of the whole year. With every new beginning, there is an end. This is why the Japanese school year begins during the time of the cherry blossom season where students begin school on April 1st, reflecting on the meaning of a new beginning and fresh start. I think we can use the meaning of the cherry blossoms for this monument that it is important to reflect on the beauty of nature and life in general, but also staying aware that life can end at any moment like those unfortunate victims of the atomic bomb. Every falling petal of those trees represents the victims that had fallen due to the selfishness of mankind to end each other's life, yet not fully realizing the fragility and beauty of life itself. To put this to perspective, we are the only known life forms in this universe so far. We simply do not know if there's aliens beyond our planet if we were to put conspiracies aside. So I think that it is important to cherish this one-time opportunity if we happen to be the only miracle of this universe that life just somehow happened on this blue marble spinning through space. The return of these future humans to Earth represents a new beginning, a fresh start on our old home. Over here is a unique T-shaped bridge that I modeled directly after a bridge in Hiroshima, close to the hypocenter of where the atomic bomb was detonated. The bridge is called Aoi Bridge, and this bridge was reconstructed as a replica in 1983, after it was partially destroyed from the atomic bomb and had survived a few decades afterwards until the replica. This bridge was actually used as a target marker of where to drop the bomb when the Enola Gay bomber flew over the city because of its distinct T-shaped design, almost like a crosshair. The bomb was originally supposed to be dropped on the ancient capital of Japan, Kyoto, but it was saved due to the U.S. Secretary of War, Henry Stemson, citing it as a city of cultural importance and was not a military target. Henry Stemson became an admirer of Japanese culture after making a few visits in the 1920s and even had a honeymoon in Kyoto. Instead, the decision was made on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in fear that bombing Kyoto would bolster the communist cause in Asia, since it would be more difficult to reconcile with the Japanese after the war. For the name, Aoi Bridge comes from the kanji Aoi, which means developing together or mutual growth. I think it plays a nice role in connecting the two sides of the river which are two neighborhoods as well, and joined it at Kakehashi Park, where we develop together and been bridging out our cultural differences. That is all for this episode, and in the next episode, I'm going to be moving away from the center of Astro and focus on the outskirts. In that case, building the airport. We've been focusing so much lately on the interior of the city, and I want to take a breather to work on the infrastructure at the edge of Astro Also in that episode, I'll be testing out a new layout of how I conduct the series. This episode was fairly short in my opinion, because this was actually supposed to be released during President Obama's visit to Hiroshima in May. But obviously school and other factors prevented me from working further on the video until now, so anticipate some changes in how I format my videos in the next episode. After that I'll be working on a future neighborhood called Rujinao. Now my classmates, 
recorded the lecture of the Hiroshima survivor. If you guys are interested in personally hearing her story, you can check out the video here. Also, you can check out my recap of my experience in Japan during study abroad. I'll see you guys in the future.